new season of God's visitation has come. A time for a greater exploit. I labor you then, little even now, causing wickedness to abound. But now I can hear you, Lord, speaking to me. Hereafter, you shall see heaven open to you. We are waiting, Lord, come and visit us. We are praying, Lord, set us on fire. We believe you, Lord, this is the set time, moving pray together. Our Father, we give you all the praise. We give you honor. We give you adoration for your faithfulness. Thank you for the opportunity of coming again, even to sit at your feet as we study. Thank you for your word that has always been the anchor of our lives. Bible says you sent forth your word and you heal them and you deliver them from all their destructions. This day again we ask, please send forth your word to us. As the choir sang, praying that you will send your revival to us today 
and release your spirit upon us. As you have promised, we want to again come before you that your word will find expression in our lives. We want to pray for your people that are gathered who have adopted this Bible study either for their church study or their discipleship class study. And those, oh God, who sit together as families and yet those that are in different places on their own following the study, we do ask, oh God, that whichever platform we are on, whether Telegram or Facebook, whatever platform, whether it is uh, YouTube or this Zoom or MixLR, whichever way, oh God, reach out to your people. But one thing we have been crying for is that your promise of open heavens will not elude any one of us. Thank you for hearing. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, last week, we uh, began uh, chapter four of this uh, book, and we have started looking at maintaining the open heavens. And we uh, came to this point because God has spoken very, very definitely from John chapter one to us. So hereafter, you will see the heavens open and you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And because of what God has said, we recognize that when God has spoken, uh, the utterance of the tongue is the Lord's, but the preparation of the heart is man's business. We saw that there was need for us to prepare and to set ourselves ready for what God has spoken to us about. Though there are a few uh, outpouring here and there that's already beginning to happen with several lives, yet we know that what, God we, are, what we are begging God for is not a very short shower. We're asking for a flood. We're asking God for something that will be enduring, a revival that will not stop again. Uh, you remember the last week, we spoke very emphatically that fire never says it is enough. God does not give a revival only to withdraw it. When you see any revival that stops, uh, what stopped it is not God. It has to be the people themselves to whom God has opened the heavens. Either they diverted the purpose of their pouring. Now today we have come to that page 149 where we will be looking at the instruction, abide in me. So we're going to be looking at the matter of abiding as a means of maintaining the open heavens, a means of keeping the, the fire that God is kindling in our lives, a means of uh, remaining fresh all the time. Now, for us to, to begin, I will request that Sister Francia, I think Sister Francia is on the platform for us, uh, Sister Francia comes to us from Canada. You will help us read John 15. We're going to again read verse 1 to verse 11. Uh, verse 1 to 11. But it would, yes, verse 1 to 11. And then verse 15 to 16. Sister Francia, can you help us read that? Yes, sir. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch 
and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Francia. We, we praise the Lord for the scriptures that we are going to be looking at. And there are a few things I would like to raise before we start to read from the book. I want you to first note that last week we noted that there are certain important convictions that must be in our heart. And the first is that Jesus himself is divine. Jesus said, I am divine. My father is the vine dresser. You are my branches. And for each one of us to recognize this is very critical. That no matter how greatly anointed you become in life, you are not divine. And you will not become divine. You will be the branch of divine. You will be only the expression of his life. All the fruits that will come out of your life, when you are properly located, will be the fruit of the vine. Our lives can only become an expression of Christ's life when we have worked well. Now, when you recognize that you are the branch, you are not the tree yourself. You are not the one that bears the root. It then becomes very critical that you will recognize that God calls us onto connectivity, connection with him rather than collection. Last week I spoke clearly about that, that God is not calling us onto a kind of reservoir tank a mentality. It is not as if you are going to bring a very big tank and you collect all the anointing, all the grace, and you keep it in a tank, and then you can be dishing it out as you like. That is not God's plan. That's not God's concept of the man he wants to use. What is the concept is that you are going to be a branch. You are going to be connected to him. And if we are connected, it means we will be drawing from his life every day. The children of Israel have to learn that, that even though God could have provided manna for one year and they would have stored it and be taken, he decided that it would be day by day. If anybody fails to gather uh, for the day, he goes hungry. And even if you gather and say, okay, I will keep some for tomorrow or next, it will grow, uh, it, will, it, will, it will stink. It will be rotting in your hand. Why? God is looking for relationship. God is looking for connection rather than collection. So as we begin this study again today, I want to note with you that Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does, that does, 
every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. We're going to be talking about those things as we go on in the study today. But two things I'd like to note, that if you are the branch, the greatest point to check, the most crucial point to check is that point of connection with the Lord himself. What you need to work at, no matter how big you have become, even if a branch of a tree becomes so large, it never carries the root by itself. And any day you cut that branch from the tree, that's the day it begins to wither. That's the day it begins to fall off. That's the day it will begin to dry up. So let's quickly begin by noting that the instruction Jesus is giving to us today, he said, I say this thing to you, this thing have I spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So let's quickly now go where in page 149, and we're looking at abide in me. Abide in me. Uh, we have read John chapter 15 from verse 1 to uh, 11 and 15 and 16. And so we now want to look at the most, the next most crucial matter that we need to face squarely. Abide in me. So we will ask Brother Derek to start to read that portion for us as we study. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. John 15, verse 4 to 5. This is the next most crucial matter you must face squarely. If the anointing only flows from the vine into all of us as branches, then the greatest point to watch is the point of attachment to the vine, your personal point of contact and communion with the Lord. The true vine is the crucial point that determines whether you will blossom more and more or you will dry and wither out. Yet this is where most men fail. This is where great men stumble. When the heavens open to a man, a lot of breakthroughs come in ministry, in material blessings, and in human relationship. Human contacts become much more a matter. He may even have to sit up late in the night to do service his contacts with men. There will be much to do with public relations, but then heavenly contact with the Lord unwittingly breaks down as men pull him here and there until, until his noodle junction gets severed from the Lord. Thank you. I think we should stop there first. And uh, if you look at the, the scriptures that we have read, and you can read the text that we have read also, you will notice that there are two things that Jesus had pointed out, which I want us to take note. He said, abide in me. That's in verse 4. And I in you. What does that imply? When he used the word abide in me, that's what he's saying. Stay connected to me. Stay connected. Let your know that junction be without a break so that my life can flow into you. So that my grace can flow into you. So that the, the, the sap 
of Christ's life may flow into you so that people what they will touch will be the conduit of his life that is flowing through you, that is coming through you. So if heaven's open to you, this will be a very crucial matter that you need to watch. I'm not going to deal with the rest of that verse now because we're going to be talking about it in a, a gradually. The first word we're trying to understand now is the word abide in me and I in you. We don't yet want to deal with whether you bear fruit or not. We're just first noting that if a branch does not abide in the vine, what will happen to it? He is cast out and it will wither. It will wither out. And men, that may even be the reason why you are, you are disconnected. They will not honor you. They will also cast you out and you become a non-entity even in their eyes. You become a failed project even in their consideration. He said, this man used to be this, but now he's dried up. But now he's a withered man, and they will not come near you again. So now, if you have the book, those of you that have the book, you will notice that we are trying to illustrate what is the nodal junction. You see a small diagram of a tree that they pointed out there. Now, you will notice where we set the arrow, that's the nodal junction, that is the point of attachment of the branch to the tree. That's the point of connection, and that's the point of intake. That's the point where all the nutrients that is flowing from the stem or from the trunk of the tree itself close to the branches. All that will make the branches to produce leaves and to bear fruit and to stay fresh, they come from the, the, the trunk that bears the root and brings in all the ingredients and the nutrients that makes a tree to grow well. Now, so the question we want to deal with now is how to protect that point in your life. How to make sure that that point is not severed or severed, you know, from the Lord. We are noting that when the heavens open to a man, usually there are a lot of breakthroughs that come upon him in ministry. Material blessings come and even human beings, they are attracted to you. And so you may have so much of human contact that may become much more. And in order to keep servicing the contact of human beings, you may quietly, unwittingly, begin to neglect or allow your contact, the place of communion, the place of with, I mean, drawing in, uh, 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 nutrients, you may allow it to begin to tear apart. It may even be the activities of ministry that will take you off. You are worn out already. You are getting spent and you are not finding refilling. You are not getting refreshed anymore because the Nola Junction has been affected. So Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. And this I'm telling you so that your joy may be full. I'm telling you this so that you can last in my purpose. So we're going to be looking at the word abide as we study on. So I want you to go on, Ebra Dari, for another a little more and go on reading. We said the nodal junction is a point of branching out. Yes, Brother Dari. Yes, sir. Yet this nodal junction is the point of intake of nutrients and even the anointing. 
The life-carrying sap from the fine flows into the branch through this point. Mm -hmm. Much ministerial responsibilities come with heaven being open unto a man. Many want to sit on his life and cast their cares upon him, thinking he is strong enough to bear their weights. If he does not protect his noodle ju junction, it will tear apart. Men that excitedly pulled him out of this divine contact soon abandon him as his fruitfulness begins to wither in their very eyes. He then soon sheds his leaves and shrinks with dryness. Jesus said, Abide in me. Don't pull apart. Don't break away. Don't get carried away. What men see in you is just my influx into your life. You cannot maintain it once you are severed from me. Please wait on that. Wait on that before we go ahead. Now, so that's the first issue we are raising. Yes, open heavens will bring you more responsibilities. Open heavens will enlarge your circle of influence. Open heavens, by the grace of God, we make men to look up to you as a source, as a channel through which God's blessing will come to them. But if you forget to service your own nodal junction, your own point of intake, uh, the trouble is that you will soon begin to wither out you begin to tear apart. Those who came to you excitedly before now, when they see that you are beginning to wither in their very eyes and your fruitfulness are beginning to reduce drastically, even though for some time your voice may still be loud, you may still be shaking your body like something did, but the truth of the matter is that when you separate yourself from me, you can do nothing. Now, the Lord Jesus, when he said, abide in me, I thought we should quickly amplify that word, abide. Abide means don't pull apart. Don't break away. Don't get carried away. Don't have an exaggerated sense of your importance. You are only as important as you abide in the Lord. You are only useful because you are connected. People are blessed when you preach. People are blessed when they touch you. People are blessed when you do one thing or the other. Only because you are connected. It is the life of Christ that is flowing into your life. He said, what men see in you is just my influx into your life. You cannot maintain it once you are severed eh, from the Lord. You cannot, you have no capacity to keep it. It will, it will dry up as soon as you are cut off from the Lord. Uh, the, the root it's not in you. The root remains in the Lord. So, Brother, please go ahead, stay. The root of the anointing. Yes, sir. <clears throat> the root of the anointing is Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. He is the underground source of all fruitfulness. Amen. Roots are usually buried underground. Mm -hmm. It is your contact with him and your attachment to him that allows the sap of his glorious life to flow into you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more, no more can ye except ye abide in me. This is clear, unambiguous, and final. No branch bears fruit of itself. It is only as it remains in the vine that it buds and brings forth fruit. No more can you, 
it is impossible to bring forth fruit for God when you Which have broken you, that contact. Can you can you take that again? It is impossible. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to keep bringing forth fruit for God when you have broken that contact. Mm. For without me, you can do nothing. nothing. The man that abides in me, the vine, and I in him, the same, not another, bringeth forth much fruit. If you want to bring forth much fruit for God, you must abide in him. The noodle, con the noodle contact point must be kept intact no matter the outbursts you are already experiencing. Most men ignore this injunction, believing that the sap will always flow, though the contact is no more intact. The sap may even flow to that point, but if the point is severed, it can only drip down into the ground and glut away in waste, in wastage. Right. What? Watch that. Okay, can so I, can I just wait that one first. Yes. Thank you. Now, again, let us agree together on this matter, the brothers and sisters. The root of the anointing is Jesus Himself. Even when the Bible says God is saying, very, very I say unto you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open. And you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It is upon Jesus that every genuine open heavens can anchor. So how does he flow to me? It is my own connection with him. What God is doing and what God will yet do in our time will be central on Christ. Christ is divine that God is growing. Christ is the is God's word, is God's focus, is God's uh, answer for our generation. And that's what God is presenting. And this open heaven we speak nothing else apart from Christ. And so if I'm going to be part of the opening of the heavens, what I must do, I must abide. I must connect. I must remain in him. So we noted that roots are usually buried underground. What draws it out for us, what draws the life up, is your contact with him and your attachment to him. That's what we allow the sap of his life, of his glorious life, to flow into you. And it's very emphatic, as the brand cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. There's nothing we will be able to accomplish. In fact, when your contact with him begins to break, even if the anointing wants to flow, when it gets to that point of breakage, it becomes a point of wastage. So every time you allow your contact with God to be broken, every time you allow your abiding point to reduce, what you are simply doing is that you are wasting the grace of God and you are wasting the opportunity for God to flow through you to bless your generation. Now, I dare, I can't overemphasize this. I saw that Jesus himself did not uh, mince word about it, he was final about it, and there's no need uh, to be apologetic about this. Without me, you can do nothing. Let us agree that if he is not flowing through us, there's nothing to give me. If he is not the one working in us, no work actually is done. If it's not the one working in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, 
whatever it is that you are doing is unacceptable to God. So let us quickly note this before we go ahead. We said when men ignore this instruction or they take this injunction for granted, believing that they have grown to a level where even if their contact with Jesus is broken, they can do something. That is the peri that has brought down so many. Sometimes you become self-confident and say, yes, God has been using me for many years. Even if my contact breaks with him, I will still be able to do something. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And I reckon that nothing means not a single thing will you be able to accomplish. Now, let's go to Soma. Is Soma on the line? Can we ask Soma to pick it from where Brother Dari stopped? Uh, we're now on page 152, and uh, we stop at the point. Say, so watch that point. Is Soma there? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Soma, how are you today? I'm well. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. It reads, watch that point. Run away from the public to bind your nodal joint more properly until the life of the vine surges more forcefully into the veins of your heart. Secret prayers, self-withdrawals from the crowd, personal fastings and abstinence, and deep personal study of God's word for the heart and not for the congregation are what we saw with Christ as he walked here under the open heavens. He was never too busy to keep his contact intact. He refused to act from himself, by himself, and for himself. He suspended all actions until he had heard from above. Paul mm -hmm. was able to labor and finish his course because he learned this secret. Elijah's heavens could not be maintained when he begun to run from the place of abiding. Dwelling under the shadow of a br broom tree does not make up for a break in contact from the shadow of the Almighty. Now, uh, Soma, please wait. Mm -hmm. We're just going to enter into the next definition of abiding. Now, we're saying that for you to honestly abide in order to maintain the open heavens over your head, in order to maintain the fresh outpouring of the Spirit, or the fresh influx of his life into you that people need to touch every day. You need to watch that point. If there's something I want you to keep a VG on, keep a VG on your connection with God. If there's something to watch diligently, if there's something to say to you as a very, very busy preacher or a very busy disciple or someone who wants to be a constant source and channels of blessing to people. You know, last week was, I was singing to you, channels only, channels only. But this day, I want to request you that if you are going to do well as a pastor, as a preacher, as a student, as a man who won't go to work with him, all of, all of you that are longing for the grace of God to be made manifest in your life, there is a point to watch. And that's the point of your connection with God. That's the point of your connectivity with the Lord Jesus. And how do you maintain that place? We say, run, run away from the public. Why must you run away from the public? You can't meet God in the public. He said, your father who is in secret, who sees in secret, that's where you can encounter God fresh for yourself every time. All we are saying is that your point of connection must be kept private in the secret place. And that's where this flow of his life, the life of divine, can surge more constantly and forcefully into the veins of your heart. So we're talking about secret personal prayers, personal self withdrawals from the crowd into his presence, 
personal fastings and abstinence, and deep personal study of God's word for your life, for your heart, not first for the congregation. Not first, what am I going to preach to people? But the word of God for your own life. The word of God that will break forth upon your own heart. You need to create space where you can sit down and get as much into your system. This is what we saw Jesus Christ himself practice when he walked there under his own open heavens. We saw that Jesus Christ himself spent time to, to be with his father. He was not presumptuous because he knew himself as a branch. Actually, God called him the branch. And he kept saying, of my own self, I can do nothing. What I see my father do, that I also do. We saw that this is what Jesus did. This is how he operated. The crowd did not crowd him out of the presence of his father. So if you are going to last in the anointing, if you are going to speak for, your, for the Lord for a long time in your life, and if your message is going to create an enduring impact, every time you open your mouth, let it be an outflow, or let it be an influx from the Lord into your life, into your heart, and then an outflow of that life through you to touch others. This is how to maintain the open heavens when God will have answered our prayer. Now, they alluded to Elisha. It's so painful to me that uh, Elisha, who said, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand. When Elijah began to run away at the threat of uh, Jezebel, that was the beginning of the decline of the fresh power that came on his life, and the work that he was doing was coming to an abrupt end. I said that there's so much that God wanted Elijah to do, but that break uh, began to reduce him. And I just want to, we know, I'm noting that for you because no matter how great God has used you, the only thing that will keep you fresh and useful and uh, bearing much fruit is to abide. Don't let anything take you away from that secret place. Let's check our point of connection. Don't let sin come between you and that point. Don't let business come between you and that point. That's the point to watch. Now, go ahead, uh, Sister Soma. All right. Abide in me. The man mm. who will heed this injunction and watch over it with carefulness will renew his strength and bring forth fruit even at old age. It's not mm. a collection point that Jesus established for his servant, but a connection point that ensures the influx of heavens into a man's heart. Watch the branch of a tree that it bears fruit. The point where men collect its fruits into their baskets and sacks is not the point of his connection to the stem. Wow. Do not, oh. Don't go. Don't go yet. Sister Soma, please wait. I just want you to note two things we have raised there. God has not established a collection point for you. Rather, what Jesus is establishing for me and you is the connection point. Connection rather than collection. If you remain connected to the Lord, there will be constant outflow in your life. Because he never runs dry you will also not run dry. What they call burnout will not attend to your life because you can't be born out when you are connected to the very source that never, never gets dry. But now, I want you to note that even when people will be getting blessed through your life, when people will be collecting fruits from your life, if you look at the tree, there is no tree that brings forth its fruit at its nodal junction 
to this term. The point of your fruitfulness must always be away from your node junction. So don't allow people to think that unless they pull you from that point of connection, they can't get any blessing. So we want you to separate. That's what I'm trying to say now. Separate your own point of communion with God, your own point of connectivity with God. Separate it from the point of ministry. Let ministry only be the result of this point. Your outgoingness should be what people should touch. But your own inner life must be in the secret place. If you want to last, that's what we are talking about. If you want to maintain the open heavens over your head, your secret place of communion with God must be kept secret. And when I use the word secret, I'm not talking of secrecy in terms of doing something that is not correct. Secret because it is not for public consumption. Secret because it must not be eroded. Secret because it must be protected. If there's any point in my life that I need to protect seriously, that is the point. If anything goes wrong between me and the congregation or between the people that I'm working with, it's bad enough. But it's going to be terrible if something stands between me and the Savior. If something stands between me, my soul, and my Savior. So you know the song we used to sing? I hope I will still be able to sing to you. That song says, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Not of this world, the lucid dream, must ever my heart sever from him. I must be careful that there be nothing between me and the Lord. So we want to note now that the branch of a tree that will bear fruit, it is not the another junction that people must crowd out. Don't let them crowd you out of the presence of God. Don't be too busy as to miss your connection with God. That's what I'm trying to say. Keep your nodal junction away from the outlet of your ministry if you plan to walk tall with your God. I hope we can go on now, Sister Soma. So let's go now to repeated pruning. All right. Just to finish the last sentence, let's see. A repeated pruning. Okay. God does not desire a man that has come under open heaven to fail. To the man who bears no fruit, God denies his attention, but not so for the one who bears fruit for the kingdom. Hmm. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. John 15, 2. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Amplified. Let's ask, let's ask Sister Francia to read that John chapter 15 verse 2 for us from the Amplified Version. Do you have the Amplified Bible Classic? Uh, yes, sir. All right, can you read that for Classic. us? Verse 2. Yes, verse 2. Okay, verse 2. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that mm. stops bearing, he cuts away, trims off, takes away, and he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit, to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. Amen. All right. All right. So as we are going on now, I'd like you to now note that we are looking at how God himself desires to maintain the open heavens over your head, how he wants you to continue on the path of ever-increasing fruitfulness. What does he do? We are talking now about repeated pruning. So, Soma, go ahead. All right. To remain fruitful and ever-fresh under open heavens, 
you must allow divine prunings. It is repeated, it's the repeated pruning of a man's life under the sword of the spirit that keeps him sharp and focused. Mm -hmm. When heavens give rain, several things grow very fast. Several plants shoot out since the ground is now softened. Even weeds grow much more when it rains. Such extra growths, unwanted shoots, untrimmed branches of a branch, cumber the plant, sap its energy, and divert it from bearing the desired fruits for the vine dresser. The heavens closed to so many men, not because they were not well watered, but because they refused, refused the prunings that would have kept them in shape and in check for the master's use. Some grew untamable as they sprouted with anointings without submitting to any spiritual discipline that would have trimmed their appetites. <laughs> wow. Let's wait a bit on this. Let's wait a bit on this. We're talking about how the father prunes or purges every brand that bears fruit so that it may bring forth more fruit. So let me first raise two issues there. When you begin to bear fruit in any direction, God wants more fruit. Whenever there's a trace of fruitfulness in your life, it confirms that you are actually viable to bear fruit. So God's interest is to give you to bear more fruit. So let's note that. The Lord's plan for every man he calls and every man he has anointed is never to stagnate him. God's intention is that and it glorifies God that you keep growing. It glorifies God that the work he has called you to do is expanding. It is to the glory of God that his work on earth should increase. So permit me to quickly say to you that why we are not looking for men who are ambitious, we are not looking for those who are seeking uh, propaganda, and we are not looking for people who are still in the grip of self, of Mr. Flesh, and they just want to show here and there. No. God is interested in more fruit. Whatever people have said, oh, oh, Bragbile has been a blessing to us. Bragbile has done this. If you go to the heart of God, if there's any fruit that you have uh, got from my life, God is saying, but you can produce more. There's something more that that brother should be able to produce, which is not yet producing. So what do we do to him? God, in his mercy and in his love, what does he do? He comes with his own uh, trimmers to trim, to prune again, to purge, so that we may bring forth more fruit. Uh, Pastor, I want to tell you that even though your church is bustling, if you go to the heart of God, God is saying, I can have much more from you. If your message has been blessing people, if you go to God, God is saying, but you can bear much more. You can still touch much more lives. To be so satisfied and begin to congratulate yourself about the few fruits that has come to your life now is unlike a man that God wants to use. The man that God uses is a man that God is ever pruning for him to be ever increasing, ever fruitful, ever enlarging, ever growing. That's the will of God for us. And since God wants us to keep growing, God wants more fruit from our lives, then his method is to cut away from us anything that can waste the sap of his life flowing through you. Unwanted shoots, he wants to cut it off and prune it. He wants to purge you so that nothing encumbers your life from becoming more fruitful. This is what we are talking about. When the heavens open, let me tell you something. It can come with such blessing that will wake up old appetite from your, mouth, from your life. 
if God does not continue to prune and trim off all sorts of strange appetites, it may corner you out. It may pull you on the other side. And your life may never reach the height for which God has set it. So we are saying that God prunes those that are beginning to bear fruit to take away things that will cumber the ground, things that will cumber the tree. So look at what we wrote here. He said, such extra growths, unwanted shoots, on trim branches of a branch. What they do is to cumber the plant, sap its energy, and divert it from bearing the desired fruits for the vine dresser. And so the heavens begin to close to so many men, not because they were not well watered, but because they refused the prunings that would have kept them in shape and in check for the master's use. Now, I wanted to add one word here before we continue. Now, you know, when the anointing comes, when the heavens open on your life, a lot of people look up to you for blessing because, yes, God has introduced you to them. But that also is the peri. Everybody is sucking from you, sucking from you. If you don't take time to keep your nodal junction intact, you will soon run dry. That's one. Number two, strange things that may be growing around your life. Some indulgences. It could be indulgence about things. And because people already have accepted you, they have begun to uh, praise God for you, they can plug their eyes and give you. So if you are not a man that has put a knife on his throat to cut down your appetite, you may develop pot bellies. Because there's too much now, there's too much meat to eat, there's too much... Uh, 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 drinks to drink and all of this and you may no longer uh, keep the altar of your consecration as we spoke last time so you may become untamable you may not find time again to go for bible study or to sit down where you can hear the word of God you may appear so big that even those who could have called you to order they are so afraid because you have become so popular. But this is where you need to check. The pruning of the Lord. And sometimes he does it through other hands. You must be very, very available for God to continue this spiritual pruning in your life. Uh, don't allow untenable things to grow with the sprouting anointing in your life when the heavens are opened. May the Lord help you to submit for him to keep trimming your appetite so that you can remain intact even for the kingdom of God. Now, I want us to note, so you want to start reading from, note the word every branch. Can I ask you to return back to the John chapter 15 that we have been reading. John 15 is our text of study. And I wanted to say that every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the vine dresser, takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So we want to note the word every branch, every branch in me. So Sister Suma, you want to go on reading from that point. All right. Note the word every branch. Any and every man that will bear fruit and bear it in a plentiful and excellent manner must experience this repeated cleansing of the Father, the purging, mm -hmm. the prunings, and the several discipline of the vine dressers. There is no man that can bear the anointing about for a long time that will not pass through this repeated purging by the word of God. It is the only way God has ordained for every branch in him to remain fruitful and progressively useful. Mm. Are, are you expecting to walk with God and bring revival to your own generation? Then do not resist this experience. Every branch must go through. When Jesus rose to wash the feet of the disciples at his last Passover meal with them, 
Peter unwittingly refused this necessary cleansing. Thou shall never wash my feet, John 13, 8. He apparently assumed a superiority in his heart. He wondered why each man could not wash his feet by himself. He also mm -hmm. thought it was unnecessary for Jesus to do this. Many of us, once we begin to experience a little upsurge of grace and anointing, feel we have arrived. We think we have grown beyond this necessary daily routine, cleansing at the laver of cleansing. Exodus 47, 30 and 32. This we, oh. Please, can we wait to read that stuff, Francia? Can you quickly help us to go to Exodus chapter 40, and we read verse 7 and verse 30 to 32. Just to understand this daily provision that God is making for those he will use. Exodus chapter 40. Exodus 40, chapter, or, sorry, Exodus chapter 40, verse 7. And you shall set the lever between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. And then verse 30. Sorry. Verse 30 to 32. Okay. Verse 30. He set the lever between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing. And Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting and when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on reading, I want you to note what we are talking about. That when Jesus said, every branch in me, without exception, no matter how big this branch has become, or no matter how tiny it seems to just be starting, every branch in me that bear fruit, my father purges. Every branch. If you are going to bear fruit, this repeated cleansing of the Father, the purging, the prunings, and the several disciplines of divine dressers, you cannot avoid. Cannot avoid. Dear brother, I want to ask you, if God plans that you will experience an outflow of his power for a long time, and you are ever going to be increasing and never decreasing, and that God is going to continue to move you from one degree of glory to another, then you cannot run away from these uh, pruning shares that God must apply to your life regularly. Now, let me say to you that this pruning is not just because of sin. Even when what is shooting out of your life is not sinful, but it's a distraction, it's a diversion, it's a wastage of nutrients. It's, a, it's an unuseful engagement of the grace of God in your life. God will prune it. Sometimes it may be men, it may be acquaintances that are no more uh, compatible with what God wants to do in your life. He will have to prune them. I've seen all those prunings again and again in my life at various points. I've seen God separating us from those that have no business with where God is taking me. And God said, no, this man cannot go with you because his journey is not in your direction. Allow him. Prunis that God uses to keep us in shape is something that we cannot avoid if you are to grow well. Now, the next point we have raised is the unconscious presumption that makes some of us think that because God has used us or because God is using us, you don't need this pruning again. It's a very costly assumption for you to imagine that, ah, I've grown enough. And for that reason, where God could still prune your life, you are not available there. So Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples and Peter said, no, 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 no. Thou shalt not wash my feet. <coughs> Everybody should wash their own feet. 
And if anybody is going to wash people's feet, it should be one of our juniors, not you, sir. But you see the way the Lord Jesus confronted and said, unless, unless I wash you, unless I wash you, you will not have part with me. We are going to read that, so now you are going to pick up from there. But you know, look at Exodus 40 that we have asked you to refer to. Now in Exodus 40, uh, the concept of the lava, a bath, where people are supposed to wash, they should wash their hands, they should wash their feet before they get to the altar. What is the, what is the provision of that? The provision of daily, regular cleansing of our lives. You take bath, some of us, we take our bath two, three times a day. It is not because you are sick. It's because it is necessary for you to keep refreshed. So also the lava has been provided to wash away every dust or contamination between you and the world and to wash away everything that is that has accumulated around you, the sweat, when you perspire and all of this, God wants to wash it off. The lava stands for the bath, the fountain, with the blood of Jesus uh, provides to cleanse us from all sin. It also represents the word of God, the water of regeneration that cleanses. It says, sanctify them by their truth. Thy word is truth. The more you sit before the word of God, the more you dip yourself in the word of God, the more God prunes you, the more God refreshes you, the more God removes layers and layers of accumulated sweat upon your soul so that you can come before God fresh. Even Moses and Aaron, they washed at the lava before they came to the congregation or before they came to the presence of God. So let's note that provision as we go ahead. So you are going to pick it from this cleansing. I hope you have noted where you stopped. Yes, sir. Go ahead. This cleansing is a requirement for stepping into God's presence. Once a man steps out from the Shekinah glory and gets in contact with men of this world, it is safer for him to come humbly before the Lord as a child, needing the cleansing of his feet. Jesus answered Peter in a very thought-provoking way. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part for with me. Look at the weight the Lord has attached to this routine cleansing. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me, no share in companionship with me amplified unless you let me wash you peter you cannot be my true partner phillips the cleansing is a precondition for having a part with the lord part in him and in his work it is the only way to remain his true partner peter had left his ship nets and fishes he had climbed mm -hmm. mountains with his lord he had seen him transfigured before his very eyes he had walked with him on water in in a tumultuous and tempestuous sea. Yet this cleansing could have uprooted him from being a true partner with his Lord if he had indeed become too big to be washed. Peter apparently did not understand the gravity. He thought it was a casual exercise that he could avoid. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, my father purges. Though uh, we are please, please, mm -hmm. please wait, Sister Soma. Yes. Before we go on now. Now, I want you to note the way Jesus put it. He said, if I wash you not, thou hast no part with me. I want you to see the weight of that instruction. It's very important not to rush it. Unless I wash you, you have no part with and in me. You have no share in companionship with me. So brother, if God will not keep washing our lives and pruning it, he said you will have no part with me. That is tantamount that you will break away from me. 
And if you are no longer having companionship and the fellowship with the Lord, you become withered, you become a withered plant. And there's nothing that will come out of your life except dryness. And when Philip's modern English put that verse, he said, unless you let me worship, I mean, wash you, Peter, you cannot be my true partner. Let me confirm that from Philip's modern English. Philip's modern English, can you bring it out? We're reading John chapter 15 and verse 2. Do you have Philip's there? Can you read it quickly? John, not able to see it. John 15. Oh, you have seen it? John 15? Yeah. Can you read? You want to read it for me, Soma? Yes? Yes, I can. Read it says, it. Um, verse 2, it says, um, I am the real vine. Oh, it's, it, mine starts at verse 1. And just, just read from verse 1, okay. because I know it's joined. <laughs> I am the, the real vine. Yes. Uh, my father is the vine dresser. He removes any of my branches which are not bearing fruit, and he prunes mm -hmm. every branch that does bear fruit to increase its yield. Mm -hmm. Now you have already been pruned by my words. You must go on growing in me, and I will grow in you. Uh, you know, you know the passage I wanted you to read uh, yeah. from from John chapter thirteen. Thirteen verse. Not John fifteen. Yes. Please All right. Go to John thirteen for I us. Um, That's eight. Okay. In Phillips, the one I'm yes. reading says, "Then yes. Peter said to him, you must not, you must never wash my feet unless you.' And it says, unless you let me wash you, Peter.'" replied Jesus, you cannot share my lot. That's mm. Unless you let me wash you, Peter, you cannot share my lot. So can you imagine that when he says you cannot share my lot, it means you cannot be a true partner with me. You cannot run with me. You cannot become what I want you to be. This is very crucial. And I pray that God will help each one of us at this point in the name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead now. <clears throat> the cleansing. Though we are cleansed by the word and the blood at the point we come to him for salvation, a regular, in fact, daily cleansing of our feet is necessary to remain true partners in his ministry. Many great men of God at the point when men here and there look for them, sing their praise and fall willingly under their anointing, think mm. this feet washing at the laver is no more necessary for their lives. They presume to enter into God's presence, not on the basis of their present state of cleansing, but on their past performance on the platform of ministry. Mm. They suppose that God will surely respect them because of the great exploits they are doing in his name. They allow little particles of sin and dust of worldliness on their lives. The sweat of hard labor for the kingdom wets these particles and makes them stick rather than permanently forming a um, rather permanently forming a coat or a layer on their sensitivity to God's touch. Mm -hmm. Thus a crust is formed against the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Their tears of brokenness dry up and they become familiar with the message against sin and worldliness. Mm. Please don't go yet. Don't go yet. The point that we are raising here is that this washing of our feet is first and foremost because of our contact with the world system. As long as you are walking in this world and you are touching men of the earth, you need your feet to be washed. As long as we are not isolated, and we are not insulated from touching the world, touching the earth. It is safer for us, for God to bring us constantly for pruning, to check our lives out, to wash us out, to purge us, to make sure that there's no little dust, no little particle is standing between us and God. We said many, many great men of God at the point when heavens are open to them, 
when men here and there are looking for them, singing their praise, and people are falling willingly under the anointing, they think that this feet washing at the lava is no more necessary for their lives. They presume to enter into God's presence, not on the basis of their present state of cleansing, but on their past performance on the platform of ministry. This is a big mistake. Sometimes you think that because God is using you and many souls have been helped and brothers and sisters seem to be, you know, touched with your life and your ministry, you might think that, wow, you are a big man now. And that it will be difficult for God to discard you if you misbehave. Now, be very careful. An anointing is not first a reward. It's not a gratuity of what you did before. Anointing is a fresh outpouring of the grace of God into your life because God is looking for fresh, fresh fruit, not stale. God who used you before, thank God for all he used you to do, but that is past. That is history. God himself is the ever-present father and he's doing something new, something fresh in your life now. So he said, uh, you don't have to, if I don't wash you, if this daily regular cleansing, if you are omitting it in your life, then you are gradually going to lose your portion in his lot. He said, you will not share my lot if I don't wash you. Now, I want to read the last point here. Yeah? Uh, maybe someone, can you pick it up again and read for me? He said, the sweat of hard labor for the kingdom. Can you pick it from there? Have you seen it? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, read. Mm -hmm. The sweat of hard labor for the kingdom wets these particles and makes them stick rather permanently, forming a coat or layer on their sensitivity to God's touch. Mm. Thus, a crust is formed against the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Their tears of brokenness dry up as they become familiar with the message against sin and worldliness. We need to be careful about that. Don't allow the sweat of your work. Don't let it fall on the particles the particles of omission, the particles of carelessness, the particles of secret sin, don't let it form a cross on your soul. Don't be familiar with those things to the extent that your spirit is no more sensitive to God's touch if you want to last under these open heavens that we are trusting God for. If you want to be a man that every time you speak, people are blessed, people's lives are touched, and your life is a channel of blessing to people, then you must be very, very careful of little, little, little imperceptible omissions, imperceptible compromise, imperceptible sinfulness, and all those things that the devil would like to push into your life to block this channel. We want you to take note of that. So, so Mark, can you now read uh, that point now before we go ahead? All right. Jesus firmly told Peter. All right. Jesus firmly told Peter, Peter, you have been the pillar of this work hitherto. I have mm. invested very much on you. I have even given you the keys of the kingdom. I have shared most intimately with you. But if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Wow. So, does he so does he tell every man or woman who seeks to partner with him in the coming revival. Every branch in me, my father mm. purges and cleanses. It's a repeated pruning. To maintain open heavens over your head, you need to daily stretch your feet, your point of contact with the world, for his washing at the laver. You must sit down daily and every time to let him do it for your life. This pruning will make you bear richer and more excellent fruits. Whatever the level of your fruitfulness today, you can do better. Your fruits can be richer and much more, even in quantity. Please, please wait. Please wait. What you are reading is too, is too strong. We can't rush it now. Even though I'm looking at our time, but we need to just take it bite by bite. Now, 
You see, the what we said, a uh, Jesus family told Peter. I want to repeat it again. Say, Peter, you are being the pillar of this work either to. I have invested very much on you. I have even given you the keys of the kingdom. I have shared most intimately with you. But if I wash you not, you have no part with me. Now, I just felt that each one of us uh, that want God to use you beyond where you are now, you must hear God speaking like this. Repeated pruning, daily washing. Jesus said, every branch in me that bears fruit, the Father does that to them. And if we, we want to keep growing in the purpose of God for the heavens to remain open over your head, we need to do this daily. You need to stretch forth your feet daily. Your point of contact with the world must be laid at the feet of the Father for his worship at the lava. I must not take for granted that I am in touch with the world system. I need to come for that cleansing every time. And I want to say that let it be daily. You must sit down daily and every time to let him do it for your life. Let God purge your life. I know you know so many Bible on your head, but we're not talking about what is in your head. We're asking God to purge our lives, purge our heart, take away from it anything that will make it difficult for us to be a channel of his blessing to our generation. God says you can be better. You can be richer. God is looking for more fruit in our lives. And that's why this cleansing has become necessary. Can you read that last paragraph before we go ahead? All right. God does not look for your end, your mm. withering, or your shrinking. He wants to share with you his nature, unwavering, unfainting, and inexhaustible. And this is the only way, repeated purgings, prunings, and washings. Will you allow it? Will you pursue it no matter how big you grow? Will you always stretch out your legs, take off your shoes and socks for his washing? No man can walk along with God who has not learned what Moses, Joshua, and several others learned. Off mm. your shoes. Exodus mm. 3, 5 and Joshua 5, 15. All right. We are going to pick that differently now. So my dear brothers... And my dear sisters, God does not look for your end, in quotes. God is not looking for you to end abruptly. When God opens the heaven to you, he didn't want that heavens to close. He wants you to serve him until you go to heaven under the open heavens. God is not designing your withering or your shrinking. God will want you to experience this, the, the, the ever fresh, ever fresh life that he releases. The other day I was looking at God, say he's everlasting, he's ever living. God is ever fresh. Even though God is ancient of days, God is not ancient. It's not, it's not old. It's fresh, it's new. His messages are new every morning. God himself is fresh every time you go to him. You are not meeting a monotonous God. You are meeting a God that is sprouting and bringing something fresh and new to your life every day. God wants us to be like that. It is the will of God for us to, 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 to be sprouting, to be fresh. That's what God wants. God does not want me to become history in my lifetime. God does not want me to be drawing uh, in, in messages from the old tank. And anybody who is uh, sent it, they say, ah, no, 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 Bragulé is no more fresh. What he's bringing to us now is stale, stale bread, stale drink, no fresh. I pray that you will remain fresh all the days of your life. So for this to happen, 
will you allow these repeated hodges, these repeated prunings and washings? Will you allow it, my brother? It's a commitment you need to make today. Will you pursue it no matter how big you grow? Will you leave all the big, big things to go and go to the place of washing where they can wash your feet? I said, sometimes it is not just God that already doing it. He might want to use any of his servants to wash your feet, to bring you into a fresh renewal. But I can see that once you become so busy, you don't go for anywhere you can hear the word of God except where they have invited you to preach. And when they invite you to preach, you don't go and sit down to listen to what others have to say. I see you just going in there when it is two minutes to the time you are going to speak. You are so upset with your own speaking. You forget that God wants to wash your feet also before you can take your offering at the altar. That kind of bad habit that some of our young men are learning, I want to say to you, if you want to last under the anointing and the open heavens, your feet must be stretched out for washing. You must sit down for God to do this work in your life. You must remove all your socks. And for this washing, there's no cover-up so that God can help you. No man can walk long with God who has not learned what Moses what Joshua and several other servants learned. God said to them, of your shoes. Of your shoes. Exodus 3, 5 and Josh verse 15, chapter 5, verse 15. We're not going to read that. We want to go on quickly. So can I now call Sister Francia to help us now to read what is God's intention for us? Um, Brother Dari, can you open your Amplified Bible and help us read Psalm 92, Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14. Amplified Classic. I want you to read that before we go ahead. Psalms 92, Amplified Classic from verse 12. Yes, okay. Yeah. The uncompromisingly righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, be long lived, stately, upright, useful, and fruitful. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon, majestic, stable, durable, and incorruptible. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. Growing in grace, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They mm. shall be full of sap, of spiritual vitality, mm. and rich in the vendure of trust, love, and contentment. Amen. So what we are saying is that this is the intention of God for you. God's intention for your life and ministry. If you will allow him to always cleanse and put your life, is what we have read in that passage. Said the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the court of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit, even in old age. Even in old age, they shall be fat and flourishing. I asked Dory to help us read that section because I want to say to you that God's plan is that even at old age, you'll be bearing fruit. Even at old age, something fresh, you will still be flourishing. You will still be bringing fruitfulness. You will still be, you know, I, I just love the word to flourish. To flourish is, is not just that you are growing. It is that you are growing well. It is that everything about you is flashy, is flashing, is flourishing, is fresh. You are not drying. You're not drying up. There are people that are living, but you know that glory has left them. They are alive. They have not died, but you know that they are drying up. Even when they come on the road to preach, they just speak old things. 
that doesn't carry fresh light because something has happened to the another junction. So the will of God, why you need to be available for re repeated cleansing is because God's will is your continuous growth, your increase. Have you got fruit? He said, more fruit. Have you got more fruit? He said, much more fruit. That's the will of God. Have you got much more fruit? He said, abounding, abiding, fruitfulness. That's what God is planning for your life. You can't accept to be stagnant now. I know you can be, we can thank God for where you are. We can thank God for all God has done with your life. But there's much more that God wants to do in your life. Before we pick the next point, let's ask Sister Francia to start from that page 158. It is possible to walk under open heaven. Francia? It is possible to walk under an open heaven until your very old age. You can still bring forth fruit at your old age. While others shrink and faint, you can still be growing tall like a cedar in Lebanon, growing mm -hmm. fat and flourishing. Yes. But you must submit to his washings, his purgings, and his prunings. Mm -hmm. Do not be too occupied with washing other men's feet in ministry while you fold your own up in hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. All categories of priests who want to cross from the outer courts into the inner sanctuary must report to the lover for cleansing. Your daily quiet time with God and your hours of communion must begin with your feet and your hands, when necessary, stretched out onto the Lord for cleansing. If you do this, you will never fall or fade away. You will neither faint nor fail in your life and ministry until he sends his chariots to pick you home from your own Mount of Olivet. Mm. What a matter God is raising with us today. Don't be preoccupied, my brother, with washing other men's feet in the ministry while you fold your own up in hypocrisy. When there's need in your life, step forth your legs, step forth your hand, let God uh, cleanse you, wash you, purge you, prune you on a daily basis so that you can live long, you can serve long, you can bear fruit even at your old age. So now let's see the second matter of abiding. Wow, I'm looking at our time, but we must go on now. Uh, my words abide in you. Uh, let's ask uh, Brother Dari to help us read the passage, verse 7 and 8 of uh, John 15. And then, Francia, you now continue to read from that point, my words abide in you. Let's read John 15, 7 and 8. Can we yes. try it? Yeah. So New King James Version goes, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Amen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. If you live in me, and this is amplified, if you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your heart. Ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. When you bear, when you produce much fruit, my father is honored and glorified and you show and prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. You are my disciples when you bear such fruit. Now, why am I needing to note that with you? The abiding that we're about to deal with now and my words abide in you is a very critical aspect. If the word of God will not abide in a man, he will soon begin to misbehave. He will soon begin to, you know, break boundaries and begin to dabble into issues that are not necessary. And these are the issues 
that have always stopped the open heavens over many people. So, Sister Francia, can you pick up from there? This matter may appear trivial. This matter may appear trivial, but on it hinges the principle of ever-abiding anointing. Mm. Everyone assumes that men who use the word of God on the pulpit must have the word abiding richly in them. That is, that is a very great presumption. Very great presumption, and I talk to you now as a servant of God over very many years. It is possible for you to have so much word of God in your mouth, but very little of it is at work in your heart. You may be a great expositor of Bible, but the word of God that will keep you pruned is the word in your own heart. And this is very critical for those of us that are preachers. You could really have so much to preach on several topics, but that does not affect your life. It is that which is in your heart. But I wish you will not be a preacher whose mouth is different from his heart. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's how it should be. The abundance of what God has put in your heart is what should give you utterance. But if your heart is dry, if your heart does not carry God's word, and your mouth is speaking like a parrot, you are beginning to become an hypocrite. As we pray together on this matter, let my words abide in you. Now, sister, go ahead. Go ahead now. It ought to be so. But several times, a man may only grow to apply the sword on men out there while he tactfully shields his own heart. Mm. This becomes more probable a danger when a man has entered into ministry under open heaven. When the heavens are open unto a man, men's hearts are readily broken like a ground on which it has just rained. Even a blunt stick will penetrate easily. Men tremble at every mention of God's word. Even mere reading of scriptures can work a deep conviction in the hearts of listeners. A preacher could enjoy the authority of God's word over men's hearts while his own heart is still as hard as rock. He could watch others repent and melt away under the fire of divine oracle while his own heart is full of wandering thoughts. This is the reason for this timely injunction to Christ's apostles. Mm. Thank you very much. Say, so, but this is where the critical matter is. If the heavens will remain open to you, and if you are going to remain fresh, regularly in the hand of God, let my word abide in you. Let my word be the, let it have the run of your life. Let my word become your, your own, your own work, uh, the light on your path. Mm. You may be enjoying the authority of God's word over other men's hearts because God has opened their heart. But don't let your own heart be hardened against the word of God. And what I'm saying to you is so very, very possible. You know, after officiating so many lives, you may have come to enjoy people's tears so that you, you like their tears when you have not shed one tear. Sometimes you need, to, you love to listen to other people's confession because they are confessing uh, before God in your presence. You enjoy their confession, but you have never made your own. Sometimes it is possible that you watch people, how they groan in the spirit, how they cry, and you may be rejoicing, say, my message has affected them, has affected them, but you have remained unaffected. When there is this disparity between your heart 
and what is going on on your pulpit, you are about to die. You are about to wither out. I think I will stop at this point tonight because I would like to spend time on let my word abide in you. But we will not be able to go far if I start at that point. So I would like you to please hold on at this point. Let my word abide in you. That's where we're going to start when we come next week by the grace of God. I'm not rushing this because there are critical instruction if you are going to live long. There are critical instruction if you want God to walk with you. You want the Holy Spirit to lead you, you know, and lead you well. And you want to be ever fresh in the power of the Holy Spirit. I wish you would take note of this. Now, I say we are going to sing that song before we go. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Please, can you flash it? Have you got it out for us? Nothing between. Nothing between. We like to sing it, even if it's on few stanzas. Have you seen it? Yes. Can you bring it out, sir? Mm, 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 mm. Mm, soul and the Savior, not of these words, the lucid dream, I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there is nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior. So that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. And that too, nothing between thy worldly pleasure, habit of life. To harmless the sin, must not my heart from him ever sever. He is my hope, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing. The least of his favor. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Nothing between. Like pride or station. Several friends. Shall not intervene. Though it may cost. Me much tribulation. I am resolved, there's nothing between, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Give the way clear, let nothing between. Nothing between in many a trials, though the world against me convey, watching with prayer and much self denial, triumph at last with nothing between, nothing between my soul and my Savior. So that his blessed faith may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, 
let nothing be between as we pray together. I want you to check that, know that junction. If the devil is going to attack a man of God, that's where he's going to put the dagger. If the devil is going to stop a revival, that is what he's looking for in the life of any man, particularly those that God has opened the heavens to. He wants to go and cut them down from there. The point of connection and communion with God, the point of contact, is the point that we are saying you must abide. Say, abide in me and I in you. As you pray with me this moment, I want you to talk to God. Lord, that point of contact with you, that point of my communion with you, that place where your life flows into me, I don't want anything to stand between me and you. I don't want any short circuiting. I want a free flow. I want that channel to be not to be blocked, not to be blocked even with good things that I'm doing. Don't let even the work of ministry start between me and you. Lord, I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. I want to, you to flow to me. I want the influx of your life in everything I do. That's my cry, Lord. I want you to pray. Ask God that as we are concluding this Bible study now, all we have been able to deal with this meeting is abide in me and I in you. That's no that junction. When I come next week, I'll be dealing more deliberately on abiding. Then my word abide in you. We'll be looking at the ministry of the word of God in sustaining the open heavens. But this night, can you say, Lord, between me and you, God, let there be nothing. Self or friends must not intervene. Ministry activity must not come between me and you. The crowd, the crowd, the crowd of the congregation, let them not severe me from you. And self or, or, or friends, worldly pleasure, things that, you know, as I grow up, provision has come, God has provided, there's plenty of food in the store. Let it not stand between me and you, God. Let promote. Motion in ministry no stand between me and you. Lord, I need you to touch me. I need you to help me. I want to grow. I want to stand with you. Don't let there be a wastage of these open heavens. Don't let the sap of your anointing drop to waste because my connection with you has broken. Let's pray together. Please call on God right now and say, Lord, here am I. Do something new. Do something a deep in my life, let nothing stand between me and my Savior. Holy Spirit, we ask this night or this day, particularly as your people that have gone through this study, we saw you saying emphatically, abide in me and I in you. Every branch that does not abide in me will wither. Without me, you can do nothing. This is what you have said to us again very clearly today. Lord, I ask that you withdraw us closer. You draw us nearer. That nodal junction, that point of contact with you, our point of connection. Lord, I ask that you please help us to protect it. Watch over it for us, Lord. Let nothing stand between us and you. Let nothing creep in, imperceptible omission, imperceptible mistakes, imperceptible sin, imperceptible compromise. Don't let it come between us. Lord, I pray this day, oh God, on behalf of myself and my brothers, my sisters, no matter how we have grown, no matter what you have done with our lives before, this nodal junction must be maintained. Let nothing come between us and yourself. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us. And those who may be out there making decisions, coming back and say, Lord, repair my broken junction. Lord, I ask that you will repaired for us. There's a way in which the fine dresser brings a, a brand that is about tearing off and tying it together again until it's banded. Please bind our soul to you. Bind our heart to you, God. Bind us to the altar this, this day. Cause your word to do us good. Don't allow this message to go, you know, as if you are spoken only to the ground. Let it affect our lives, oh God. 
Let it draw us nearer. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus Christ's name, we have prayed. Amen.